guys, so February is at an end, which means it's time for my end of month reading wrap up where I review for you all the books I read in the second half of February because I already filmed a mid-month reading wrap up for the books I read in the first half and therefore if you want those reviews you can go to that video, it will be linked down below. But I have a few more books to talk to you about, some that I absolutely loved so I just want to crack straight on and tell you all about them. And first up is a sequel, and that is The Hidden Gallery, book two in the Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place series by Mary Rose Wood, which, as you may recall, I reviewed book one of The Mysterious Howling in my first wrap-up of the month. Yes, I read books one and two of the series in February. That was how much I loved book one. As soon as I finished that first book, I had to start in on book two and that's not just because there's so many unanswered questions at the end of book one it was also just such a joyful experience to read it was so engaging as a book and I can say the complete same for book two this is a middle grade series set in Victorian Britain with a bit of like a paranormal like twist to it. I say twist because the paranormal or like fantastical elements have very much been hinted at but haven't necessarily come to fruition as of yet in this series but it's just again I feel like engaging is the perfect word to describe it. It has the like levity and humour I enjoy in a middle grade but it also has like a really atmospheric like detailed historical setting that adds to the entire storyline. Again maybe it's because I read a lot of books set in the sort of Victorian era or like 1800s as a kid, a lot of like classics that were set in that kind of time period or in the early 1900s but I love that like crossover of genres and I love the childhood adventures that are set in a historical setting and this gave me so many like nostalgic feelings even though I'd never read it before. The premise of book one if you didn't see my review for that is that we follow a 15 or 16 year old uh, young woman who's recently graduated from um, this boarding school slash orphanage for young women and been trained up as a governess and is now off on her first proper job to care for these three young wards. I think one is three, five and seven who are under the care of this like aristocratic lord and his wife but they're not their biological children. They actually just found them in the woods and it looks like they have been raised by animals, specifically wolves. They've not lived amongst humans before but in comes our governess and she's here to sort of help them adapt to uh, the world around them and equally teach them German poetry and Latin and arithmetic. And I love the sort of way in which she doesn't hold back. She's like, you know, Yes, I have some um, unexpected circumstances here with the children under my tutelage, but you know, I'm just gonna go for it. I'm gonna teach them everything I would plan to teach at a sort of aristocratic ward anyway. <laughs> and that kind of adds a level of humour to it, but it really, really works. I also love the growing relationship between her and the three children, and I feel so invested in their story. If anything, book two was like more anxiety inducing. I felt like this, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily say the stakes were higher, but I constantly felt as if I had to keep reading because otherwise I would worry about what was going to be taking place and what was in the future for these characters. So I just powered through and read it really quickly because I needed to know. There's also the introduction of some new characters. We go to London in this book um, with the original characters and meet some new people, including like a young man that our governess quite like takes a shining to and their relationship is adorable and they get into some excellent hijinks including visiting the British Museum. Everything about that setting, Victorian London, off to the British Museum, going to see musical performances on the way at the West End was so much fun for me. I love all of those elements and I feel like we started to see some of the mysteries from book one develop. There is literally no answers in book one, but we start to get some more information in book two, although there's still so much mystery and um, so much to discover. In what is actually quite a long series, there are a few books in it, at least like five, I would say. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'm just checking here on Goodreads. But I'm so pleased that there's so many of them because I have just become completely enamoured. It's like a five star series for me. And it weirdly has some excellent life advice in there, you know? Little tidbits that the governess learned 
from her training and um, from her time at this boarding school. But when I'm reading the book, I quite enjoy those interjections. Yes, there's six books, so even better, and I think they're all on script, so that's where I've been reading them. I then read this book, which is Desdemona and the Deep by C.S.E. Cooney, and this is another really fascinating story. This is weird and whimsical and surreal. It's a fantasy novel, again with like historical vibes, it is set in another world, it's not like a carbon copy of our real world, it is a different world but with sort of like 1920s Britain vibes, that's where you sort of feel like you are, except that there is an underworld, like an underlayer to the world that the humans live in where goblins and other sort of weird and wa wacky magical creatures exist. However, very few people can travel between the two. And we follow our protagonist Desdemona, who is an aristocratic young woman, and I think in part inspired by historical Britain, this book has very clear like class boundaries and a class structure. We have the workers who are treated abominably, who have much shorter life expectancies, who are quite ill because of their working conditions, who are treated like property, and then we have the super wealthy, and those are the sort of two groups. And Desdemona is of this super wealthy class. Her father employs a lot of people, and what she discovers near the beginning of this book is that he has basically it made a deal with a goblin to sacrifice a chunk of his workers who are working down the mines for some sort of nefarious um, money economical purposes and is happy to sort of like give up their lives to this underworld as well as kill some of the other ones and she is shocked and appalled by this and sort of takes on like a new found investment in these people's lives. Like she was never a cruel person but she was a little bit of an oblivious didn't think to look beyond the surface kind of person and seeing what her father has done inspires her to go down into the underworld, find a way down there to rescue these miners and there she meets all these goblins and people are constantly transforming and shifting shape and it's weird and slightly creepy but also magical and so wonderful, like I loved all of that, like all of that packed together was so brilliant. It is like very surreal and fast paced because it's quite short, you kind of get chucked in at the deep end and the writing is quite like densely packed with like information and descriptions but I enjoyed that, I like kind of surrealist fiction. At the beginning of this novel I was sort of rooting for a sort of romantic relationship between certain characters to develop, there is a lot of like LGBT representation here, one character who's trans in particular and there's a lot of like um, fluid sexuality but like I said I was sort of semi rooting for a relationship that didn't happen because a different relationship happened, which, like I said, this is a very fast-paced book, occurred quite quickly for me as a reader, and I was a little bit unsure of it when I read it, but by the end I was sort of like, I, I can accept that that happened, and I'm okay with it, and I just love the world and Desna Mona as a character in general, and her character growth. I actually have come to learn that there are sort of two short story slash novellas set in this same world but previous to the events of this book. This book very much reads as a standalone, you have all the information you need, you don't need to read those short stories like I didn't, but I'd be interested to go back and read them and see how they sort of led up to the events of this book and the, and the way that the world is structured. They could perhaps act like prequels in that order if you read them and I'm planning on doing that so this was just a lot of fun and I enjoyed that combination of like historical politics and like commentary on um, exploitation alongside this weird wacky fantasy world. I then read volumes 1 and 2 in the Giant Days comic book series, so these were the bind ups of I suppose like the first like 9 or 10 issues I guess. I got them out of my library and I also have volume 3 currently out because I think they're up to date my library in, in collecting these trade paperbacks and it's just like a light-hearted, fun, easy read, so I've been really enjoying that aspect to it. It's a contemporary comic book series set at a British university. I can't actually remember if it specifies what university they're at, um, but all of the characters are English and they are met for the first time in their first year at university. They live in the same halls of residence and we follow three women in particular who have made friends and a couple of guys that are also sort of in their friendship group. And that's a lot of fun because when I think about it, I haven't read or come across a lot of contemporary fiction set at sort of college or university, particularly British universities. And there's definitely elements of it that I think are like relatable. I'm like, yeah, that totally matches up with my experience of university. Other aspects which don't, and that might just be 
because of my personal experience and also just because it is set in a fictional world. So things get slightly warped or exaggerated for comical effect, shall we say, and they are quite funny and light. I think light is the perfect way to explain these. They're just like cute, fun, slightly escapist, slightly comical contemporary comic books, which is not, like I mentioned, something I have read much of before, so it's just been fun to kind of give them a try. And sometimes, actually, I read a lot of, like, fantasy and sci-fi and, like, paranormal horror comic books, and they can get a little bit, like, overwrought and complicated and hard to follow and drawn out. And that's something I think that isn't true of this. I think this sort of, like, contemporary comical, low-stakes kind of setting is a nice change from those slightly convoluted stories I usually tend to go for. Not that I don't like them, I just think sometimes as they go on they get to be a bit much, whereas this doesn't have that. It feels like just watching a sort of like comedy sitcom about three friends at university in England on the television when I'm reading them and that's really cute and enjoyable and like I said I have volume 3 out the library at the moment so I will be reading that in March before it's due back and probably continuing on unless something terribly offensive happens in them. They're not necessarily things I'm going to think about for many years into the future but you know I am enjoying the journey and sometimes that's just what you need from literature. I then read a historical romance book and this is Suddenly You by Lisa Claypass. This is my first historical romance slash book by this author and I, I did overall very much enjoy this which is good because I am looking to expand my pool of historical romance writers that I read from and I would read something else by this author. It's about an author, so it's really fun because it's set in your sort of 1800s typical English historical romance setting, specifically London, and we follow a woman who is just about to turn 30 and she is quite a well-known author in her own right. Since both her parents died, she took the sort of inheritance she was left, moved into London, who writes quite like scandalous but well-revered novels and she herself has never actually been with a man, she's not married, she considers herself a spinster and she decides for her 30th birthday to hire herself a prostitute, <laughs> a male prostitute in order to be rid of her virginity and experience that aspect of life and this man turns up on her door as expected only for him to have no idea what she's on about and she starts up their interaction thinking that he's been sent here by this madam to have sex with her when actually he is a publisher there to talk about one of her books and she starts obviously like trying to seduce him and talking about sex and he starts to think oh who's this attractive curvy woman who's making sexual advances to me and of course things start to happen although they don't go all the way only for her to discover like a few chapters later that this man is a publisher, not a prostitute, and feel incredibly embarrassed about what happened. However, it is a historical romance novel. They do start a relationship as the book goes on. Like There is a predictability about these kind of books. And overall, I really enjoyed that. I love that she was like a reader and a writer and that he worked in like the publishing and print industry. He owned a bookshop. Like I love those elements of the setting and I generally enjoyed their relationship. My only criticism of this book is the last sort of 50 pages felt very rushed. So overall the pacing was pretty consistent as the book went on, but then there's a sort of change in their circumstances near the end and so much is packed into those 50 pages in quite an unnatural way. Like I think that could have been drawn out. It wouldn't have read too long. It could have sort of gone into the sort of 450 page range I would say. It's 375 at the moment or those things maybe should have started earlier in the novel. It was just a little bit too fast and overwhelming at the end, like it was hard to sort of get invested in the circumstances of those last 50 pages because they happened so quickly. But generally speaking, I enjoyed the journey, um, so that's not to say I wouldn't suggest reading this, that was just like a little bit of like an abrupt way to end it for me as a reader. And I will still check out more by this author in the future. Then we have another middle grade book, which is Tilly and the Book Wanderers, book one in the Pages and Co series by Anna James. This is a middle grade trilogy, the first two books are currently out and the third book is well on its way and I have been meaning to read this book for the longest time. Anna James is such a genuinely wonderful person who I really really respect and admire and her middle grade book came out not last year but the year before and ever since then you know it's been in the back of my mind and I finally got around to it. I listened to the audiobook and it was a really fun way to experience this story. 
I think the audiobook was really well narrated and atmospheric and just like added to that fun. I do really enjoy my middle grade in audiobook format, I have to say. But if you don't know what this book is about, we follow Tilly, who has been raised by her grandparents. She doesn't know really anything about her father, her grandparents or her maternal grandparents, and her mother disappeared when she was still a baby and no one knows what happened to her. So she's grown up with her grandparents who run a bookshop called Pages & Co and she sort of spends her days reading and like hanging out in the bookshop sounds like pure bliss until she starts to uncover a power within herself that her grandparents hadn't told her might happen but that is that she can speak to characters from books they can sort of come out of the books and speak to her and she can also travel into the books so in large part this book is very much a love letter to literature which is so beautiful especially to see in children's literature I think that's like a theme I've read in sort of adult books before but not so much in children's books and Tilly travels to Alice in Wonderland, Anne of Green Gables, Treasure Island and if you read any of those books when you were a kid I think it will be so nostalgic for you but it also might be like a fun way to be introduced to those worlds and it might inspire you to pick them up after reading this book. There's also a mystery element, there's a slightly sinister man that keeps cropping up every now and then when Tilly's wandering in these books and we don't know what his motivations are, we are obviously wondering what exactly happened to Tilly's mother since there was no closure on that for anyone and there's also a really really endearing friendship between Tilly and um, a young boy from school who lives next door to the bookshop and and is the son of one of her mum's old friends and they just make like a really fun duo in this book because it means you get to see different characters reacting to the same situation and how they sort of respond to it which is a lot of fun. And overall I just thought this was such a lovely story with such a unique concept. I haven't really read a story like that before and I think it works really well for the sort of middle grade fantastical genre. It's so magical but very much based in the magic of reading and it is like I said a sort of love letter to literature, a love letter to stories and reading and that was so nice to read as somebody who is a massive reader who loves books and who loved literature as a child and finds so much solace in stories. I just thought that that was really endearing. But then last but not least I read Fortuna Sworn by KJ Sutton. So this is the first in a adult paranormal fantasy romance series. So when this book first started I thought it was sort of going to be urban fantasy because it's set in the contemporary US and we follow a young woman called Fortuna who is a waitress but she's not just a waitress she's also a nightmare so one of my favourite things actually about this book is that KJ Sutton didn't entirely rely on existing magical creatures, she started to create her own and our main character is one of those creatures that she created so all of the magical creatures in this world that kind of live under the surface, hidden from society are supposed to be descended from fallen angels and one of those races that uh, came from the fallen angels are nightmares and they have the ability when they touch people to see their deepest fear and then to affect their mind and their perception of the world based on those fears. However, like I mentioned, the existence of magical creatures isn't common knowledge and they have to hide from society in order to protect themselves, otherwise they might be captured and sold at these like black markets that exist amongst those that are aware of magical creatures, if that makes sense. And we actually begin the very start of the book with Fortuna being abducted by two men who want to sell her at a market. However, she is aided in escaping this market by a strange fairy man that she's never met before and doesn't really understand why he's helping her. Of course he has ulterior motives and it turns out that he knows where her brother is. So Fortuna's brother went missing two years ago and she's basically spent the past two years consumed by her search to find her brother. They are all each other had, their parents are both dead, they're the last two known surviving nightmares in this entire world and she wants him back so when this fairy tells her that he knows where her brother is they strike up a deal and she goes to the unseely court with him and that's why I say it starts off sort of urban fantasy but very quickly we go to this sort of like fairy realm, this sort of underworld where the unseely court is based and Fortuna gets flown into a much more like intense high fantasy setting where there's fairies and other magical creatures around every corner so it becomes more fantastical. And I saw people comparing this to A Court of Thorns and Roses in the reviews. That's a book I didn't finish so I can't really speak to that. But from my perspective it very much felt like a combination of 
Sticky Stack House by Charlene Harris, The Cruel Prince by Holly Black, and The Power of Five by Alex Liddle. So if you like any of those books, or any of the themes in those books, then you'll probably very much enjoy this. It's another one that's just like very fast paced, you get flung in at the deep end, some real drama goes down, our character has to fight a lot of intense battles, and amidst that she's struggling with some like serious lust for this fairy who has brought her to the Unseelie court, and isn't quite sure whether to trust him or not. So if you like your sort of romantic, urban, slash paranormal, dark fantasy, that's like fast paced action and excitement, then I definitely think this one is worth checking out. And the sequel is actually just out, so I'll be reading that in the near future. But those are all the books I read in the second half of February, quite a few and quite a few good ones, also quite a variety I feel, which was really nice, I think I sort of like jumped around a lot in terms of genres and I enjoyed that. But I would love to hear from you if you have any thoughts on the books I've mentioned in this video and I'd also love to hear from you if you have any standout books that you read in February that you would recommend to me. But until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon, bye guys!